Section 45 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 5. Section 45. Sebastian Brandt, 1458-1521 In 1494, shortly after the invention of printing, there appeared in Basle a book entitled Das Narrenschiff, The Ship of Fools. Its success was most extraordinary. It was immediately translated into various languages, and remained a favourite with the reading world throughout the sixteenth century. The secret of its popularity lay in its mixture of satire and allegory, which was exactly in accord with the spirit of the age. The Ship of Fools was not only read by the cultivated classes who could appreciate the subtle flavour of the work, but especially in Germany it was a book for the people, relished by burgher and artisan as well as by courtier and scholar. Contemporary works contain many allusions to it. It was in fact so familiar to everyone that monks preached upon text drawn from it. This unique and powerful book carried the spirit of the Reformation, where the words of Luther would have been unheeded and it is supposed to have suggested to Erasmus his famous praise of folly. In its way, it was as important a production as Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. The Narrenschiff was like a glass in which every man saw the reflection of his neighbour, for the old weather-beaten vessel was filled with a crew of fools who impersonate the universal weaknesses of human nature. In his prologue, Brandt says, We well may call it folly's mirror, since every fool there sees his error. His proper worth would each man know, the glass of fools the truth will show. Who meets his image on the page may learn to deem himself no sage, nor shrink his nothingness to see since naught that lives from fault is free. And who in conscience dare be sworn that cap and bells he ne'er has worn? He who his foolishness decries alone deserves to rank as wise. He who doth wisdom's airs rehearse may stand godfather to my verse. For jest and earnest, use and sport, here fools abound of every sort. The sage may here find wisdom's rules, and folly learn the ways of fools. Dolts, rich and poor, my verse to strike. The bad finds badness, like finds like. A cap on many a one I fit, who fain to wear it would omit. Were I to mention it by name, I know you not, he would exclaim. Sebastian Brandt represented all that was best in medieval Germany. He was a man of affairs, a diplomat, a scholar, an artist, and a citizen highly esteemed and reverenced for his judgment and knowledge. Naturally enough, he held important civic offices in Baal as well as in Strasbourg, where he was born in 1458. His father, a wealthy burgher, sent him to the University of Baal to study philosophy and jurisprudence, and to become filled with the political ideals of the day. He took his degree in law in 1484 at Baal, and practised his profession gaining in reputation every day. In early youth he dedicated a number of works in prose and verse to the Emperor Maximilian, who made him Chancellor of the Empire, 
and frequently summoned him to his camp to take part in the negotiations regarding the holy see he was universally admired and erasmus who saw him in strasbourg spoke of him as the incomparable brandt his portrait represents the polished italian rather than the sturdy middle-class german citizen his features are delicately cut his nose long and thin his face smooth and his fur-bordered cap and brocade robes suggest aristocratic surroundings no doubt he graced by his appearance and bearing as well as by his richly stored mind the dignity of count palatine to which rank the emperor raised him he died in strasbourg in fifteen twenty one and lies in the great cathedral in addition to the pictures in the ship of fools some of which he drew while others he designed and superintended he illustrated terence fourteen ninety six the quadragesimal or sermons on the prodigal son fourteen ninety five boetius fifteen ought one and virgil fifteen ought two all of which are interesting to the artist and engraver in the original edition of the ship of fools written in the swabian dialect every folly is accompanied with marginal notes giving the classical or biblical prototype of the person satirized brandt satires says max muller in his chips from a german workshop are not very powerful nor pungent nor original but his style is free and easy he writes in short chapters and mixes his fools in such a manner that we always meet with a variety of new faces to account for his popularity we must remember the time in which he wrote what had the poor people of germany to read toward the end of the fifteenth century printing had been invented and books were published and sold with great rapidity people were not only fond but proud of reading this entertainment was fashionable and the first fool who enters brandt's ship is the man who buys books but what were the wares that were offered for sale we find among the early prints of the fifteenth century religious theological and classical works in great abundance and we know that the respectable and wealthy burghers of augsburg and strasburg were proud to fill their shelves with these portly volumes but then german aldermen had wives and daughters and sons and what were they to read during the long winter evenings there was room therefore at that time for a work like the ship of fools it was the first printed book that treated of contemporary events and living persons instead of old german battles and french knights people are always fond of reading the history of their own times if the good qualities of the age are brought out they think of themselves or their friends if the dark features of their contemporaries are exhibited they think of their neighbours and enemies the ship of fools is the sort of satire which ordinary people would read and read with pleasure they might feel a slight twinge now and then but they would put down the book at the end and thank god that they were not like other men there is a chapter on misers and who would not gladly give a penny to a beggar there is a chapter on gluttony and who was ever more than a little exhilarated after dinner there is a chapter on church-goers and who ever went to church for respectability's sake or to show off a gaudy dress or a fine dog or a new hawk there is a chapter on dancing and who ever danced except for the sake of exercise 
we sometimes wish that brandt satire had been a little more searching and that instead of the many allusions to classical fools he had given us a little more of the scandalous gossip of his own time but he was too good a man to do this and his contemporaries no doubt were grateful to him for his forbearance from a line in his poem saying that the narrenschiff was to be found in the neighbourhood of aix it is supposed that brandt received his idea from an old chronicle which describes a ship built near aix la chapelle in the twelfth century and which was borne through the country as the centrepiece for a carnival and followed by a suite of men and women dressed in gay costume singing and dancing to the sound of instruments the old monk calls it pagan worship and denounces it severely but brandt saw great possibilities in it for pointing a moral according to the fashion of his time the illustrations contributed not a little to the popularity of the book for he put all his humour into the pictures and all his sermons and exhortations into his text just as brandt in his literary qualities has been compared to rabelais so his satirical pencil has been likened to hogarth's boldness drollery dramatic spirit force and spontaneous satire characterise both artists he does not mount a pulpit and speak to the erring masses with sanctimonious self-righteousness but he enters the ship himself to lead the babbling folk in motley to the land of wisdom his own folly is that of the student and he therefore begins caricaturing himself to open the ship of fools is to witness a masquerade of the fifteenth century the frontispiece shows a large galley with high poop and prow and disordered rigging confusion reigns everyone wears the livery of folly the fantastic hood with two peaks like asses ears and decorated with tiny jingling bells one man on the prow gesticulates wildly to a little boat and cries to the passengers zu schiff zu schiff brüder es geht es geht on board on board brothers it goes it goes in these pages every type of society is seen from beardless youth to crooked age as the author asserts men and women of all classes and conditions high and low rich and poor learned and unlearned ladies in long trains and furred gowns knights with long peaked shoes carrying falcons upon their wrists cooks and butlers busy in the kitchen women gazing into mirrors monks preaching in pulpits merchants selling goods gluttons at the table drunkards in the tavern alchemists in their laboratories gamesters playing cards and rattling dice lovers in shady groves all and each wear folly's cap and bells another class of fools is seen engaged in ridiculous occupations such as pouring water into wells bearing the world on their shoulders measuring the globe or weighing heaven and earth in the balance still others despoil their fellows wine merchants introducing saltpetre bones mustard and sulphur into barrels the horse-dealer padding the foot of a lame horse men selling inferior skins for good fur and other cheats with false weights short measure and light money prove that the vices of the modern age are not novelties other allegorical pictures and verses describe the mutability of fortune where a wheel guided by a gigantic hand outstretched from the sky is adorned with three asses 
wearing of course the cap and bells the best german editions of this book are by zarnecke leipzig eighteen fifty four and gödecke eighteen seventy two it was translated into latin by locker in fourteen ninety seven into english by henry watson as the great ship of fools of the world fifteen seventeen and by alexander barclay in fifteen o nine the best edition of barclay's adaptation from which the extracts below are drawn was published by t h jameson edinburgh eighteen seventy four the universal ship come to companions ran time it is to row or carrack flats the sea is large and wide and deep enough a pleasant wind doth blow prolong no time or carrack doth you bide or fellows tarry for you on every side hast hither i say ye fall as natural who oft shall i yo unto me navy call ye have own comfort ye shall not be alone your company almost is infinite for now alive are men but few are known that of me ship can read himself out quite a fall in fellows hath pleasure and delight here can none want for our proclamation extendeth far and to many a strange nation both young and old poor man and estate the foolish mother her daughter by her side ran to our navy bearing to come too late no manner of degree is in the world of wide but that for all their stateliness and pride as many as from the way of wisdom trip shall have a room and place within me ship me foolish fellows therefore you exhort hast to our navy for time it is to row now must we leave each simple haven and port and sail to that land where falls abound and flow for whether we arrive at london or bristol or any other heaven within this our land where falls he now shall find all way at hand or frail bodies wandreth in car and pine and leak to boat troubled with tempest sore from rock to rock cast in the same undine before our inn behold away evermore the death of them that passed are before alas misfortune us causeth oft to rue when to vine thoughts our bodies we subdue we wander in more doot than mortal man can think and oft be our folly and wilful negligence our ship is in great peril for to sink so sore are we all charged with offence we say the danger before our own presence of strides rocks and banks of sand full high yet we proceed to wilful jeopardy we divers monsters within the sea behold ready to abuse or to devour mankind as dolphins whales and wonders manifold and oft the marmite song dulleth our mind that to all goodness we are made dull and blind the wolves of theirs oft do as much care yet we of them can never well beware a boot we wander in tempest and torment what place is sure where fall as my remain and fix their dwelling sure and permanent known certainly the cause thereof is plain we wander in the sea for pleasure biding pain and though the heaven of health be in our sicht 
alas we fle from it with all our might of him that together will serve two maesters a fall haste and void of reason which with own hund tendeth to take two hairs in own instant and season right so is he that would undertake him to two lords a servant to make for whether that he be lef or loth the own he shall displays or else both a fall also he is without doubt and in his purpose sothly blinded sore which doth intend a labour or go about to serve god and also his wretched store of worldly riches for as i said before he that together will two maesters serve shall own displays and not his love deserve for he that with own hund will take also two hairs together in own instant for the most part doth the both two forgo and if he own have hard it is and scant and that blind fool mad and ignorant that draweth three bolts at once in own bow at own mark shall show to he or to law he that his mind setteth god truly to serve and his signs this world setting at nought shall for a word everlasting joy deserve but in this world he that setteth his thought all men to place and in favour to be brought must loot and lurk flatter lad and lie and cloak in knave's consul though it false be if any do him wrong or injury he must it suffer and patiently endure a double tongue with words like honey and of his offices if he will be sure he must be sober and cold of his longage more to a knave and to own of high lineage oft must he stoop his bonnet in his hand his maester's back he must oft shrap and claw his breast anointing his mind to understand but bait good or bad thereafter must he draw with who he can jest he is not worth a straw but in the meantime beware that he known a check for than lieth malice a millstone in his neck he that in court will love and favour have a fool must him fine <laughs> if he were known afore and bears fellow to every boy and knave and to please his lord he must still labour sore his manifold charge maketh him covet more that he had labour serve a man in misery than serve his maker in tranquillity but yet when he hath done his diligence his lord to serve as i before have said for own small foot or negligent offence such a displeasure against him may be laid that out is he cast bar and unpervide whether he be gentle yeoman groom or page those worldly service is no sure heritage wherefore in my proof be these examples plain that it is better more godly and pleasant to lave this mundane casualty and pine and to thy maker own a god to be servant which while thou livest shall not let thee want that thou desirest justly for this service and then after give thee the joys of paradise of too much speaking or babbling 
pay that his tongue can temper and refrain and assuage the folly of hasty longage shall keep his mind from trouble sadness and pine and find there be great ease and avantage whereas a hasty speaker falleth in great dommage peril and loss in like wise as the pie betrays her birds by her chattering and cry is it not better for one his tongue to keep whereas he made perchance with honesty than words to speak which make him after weep for great loss following war and adversity a word unspoken revoked cannot be therefore the finger lie before the lips for a wise man's tongue without advisement trips he that will answer of his own foolish brain before that any requireth his counsel showeth himself and his hasty folly plain whereby men know his words of known avail some have delighted in mad blabbering and frail which after have supped bitter punishment for their words spoken without advisement many have been which should have been counted wise sad and discreet and reached well seen in science but all they have defiled with this own vice of much speaking o oh, cursed sin and offence right it is that so great inconvenience so great shame contempt rebuke and villainy should by own small member come to the whole body let such take example be the chattering pie which doth her nest and birds also betray be her great chattering clamour din and cry <laughs> richt so these falls their own folly berai <laughs> but touching women of them he will not say they cannot speak but are as coy and still as the horl a wind or clapper of a mill <laughs> End of section forty five. End of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume five.